This is the first of two lectures for the symposium, so uh, it's a long dialogue, so we're splitting it in two. The reading quiz and perusal both have details about where you stop reading. I think it's page 182. I encourage you to read the whole dialogue uh, in one go if you can, um, but it's, it's fine if you only read like half of it for Wednesday and then the other half for Friday. As you'll soon realize, it's divided into a bunch of speeches, so it's natural to stop reading after some of the speeches. So before we talk about the dialogue, uh, we're going to get some background first very broadly on uh, ancient Greek attitudes to romance and sex, because this dialogue is about love and related stuff, so we want to know the context that they're talking about these things in, and then also some narrow context about what is a symposium. So first, broadly, uh, so this is written by Plato. He was in ancient Athens, or classical Greek Athens, 400, 300 BCE, and uh, Athens is one of the city-states in what we refer to as ancient Greece, a sort of loose collection of city-states and related groups around what is now uh, Greece. And what was going on when it comes to romance and sex, because they were a very different society than what we see in much of the world today. So how did things work? So uh, it, the, the let's maybe start with marriage. So marriage was pretty much <clears throat> an institution for uh, society, for the family, uh, for, uh, you know, political unity and uh, economic unity and uh, perpetuating children and stuff like that. So it was not really expected that uh, husbands and wives would be romantically in love with each other. That's not really how things work. Uh, you would marry somebody and have children with them and uh, you were sort of expected to have a family but that was not supposed to be your romantic outlet that was not your outlet for love and to a large degree that was maybe not your outlet for sex if you were in the aristocracy uh, which plato and the other people in this dialogue belong to it's it, it, from now on like most, it's, it's hard for us to know exactly what was going on back then because this was thousands of years ago. We don't have a lot of records. A lot of the records we have are from people like Plato, uh, who are members of the aristocracy. And so from now on, as I talk about things, there's kind of an open question how much of this is referring mostly to the aristocracy and how much of this was also uh, widespread, basically in the whole Greek society, and by Greek I'm talking about sort of people who would be citizens of Athens. So if you think back to the initial lecture, uh, Athens included not just citizens, but also lots and lots of slaves and lots of medics, so resident non-citizens. And although this was not how other city-states were set up, um, other city-states had lots of slaves and other like non-residents and stuff. And so uh, for instance, Sparta shows up in this dialogue. They were not a democracy like Athens, but they had lots of slaves uh, known as halots. And so, again, this is just a disclaimer. We're going to be talking about romance and sex, but it's an open question, sort of how broad this was. This describes what was going on for the people we're seeing in this dialogue, how much more widespread, hard to say. This describes Athens and some places similar to Athens, how much of ancient Greece does it describe? Uh, I, I, I don't know. It's also an open question. Again, we just don't have a lot of records. With that disclaimer out of the way, so marriage w was not really your romantic outlet. It was not really your sexual outlet either, or maybe it was once you were married, but basically uh, th you didn't love your wife or anything. If you were an aristocratic man, and from now on we're mostly going to be talking about men because those were sort of uh, the people Plato was concerned with. Uh, women were confined to the home and really not a part of public life, so a lot of uh, Greek intellectual thought was sort of from the male point of view, and you'll get that pretty clearly in the symposium. And so if you were a man and you had sort of sexual desires, and especially if you were an unmarried man, or you were attracted to men rather than women, and you would be married to a woman, there wouldn't be marriage to men, and you had sexual desires, you would have sex usually with, um, well, not usually, you would have sex with a prostitute. 
basically. And so that was uh, where your sexual outlet was taken care of, especially in Athens, less so in other city-states, but especially in Athens, strong sexual desire was taken to be sort of something to master as opposed to something to indulge in. So it was similar to other bodily desires, so like desires for food and drink. You weren't really supposed to like give in to this. It was, you were looked down upon if you made too big a deal about this. So the thought is you shouldn't let yourself be like obsessed with sex or anything like that. Um, love should not be about sex or things like this. Sex is a kind of a desire to uh, master. So uh, if marriage is not about romance and sex is not about romance, what is up with romance? So uh, to a large extent, like, so if you think about the way the society was set up, women are afforded effectively no status, they're confined to the home. So if you're an aristocratic man, you're like a high status man, uh, you, there's really no romantic partners available to you who are women, who are going to be sort of of your stature, because uh, women sort of have no status in society. So if you want, if you have romantic feelings and you want them uh, sort of socially, to be socially acceptable in a way that like they're with somebody of your equal. So I, sorry, I shouldn't have said socially acceptable. I should have said, if you want to love somebody who's your equal, if you want to have a romance with somebody who's sort of uh, on, on an equal status with you, first, of course, they have to be a man because no woman can ever approach your status. And the way in which this usually played out is that you would have older men pursuing younger men. And so how old is old? How old is young? Old is basically everybody who's not young. So as soon as uh, you're old, you're old. So, uh, okay, let's first do who is young. So who is young? The thought was uh, basically once you've got like a beard, you're not young anymore, you're old. So of course you can get a beard relatively early if you're a man, or at least if you're a Greek man. So old is going to be like 20 and up, and then young is going to be under 20. And of course these are very rough ages. But basically, you'd be old man, so 20 plus, um, pursuing young man uh, below 20. And that was your sort of romantic uh, life. And so what does this look like? So you're, uh, well, I mean, we're going to see a lot of it in the symposium because this is kind of like the paradigm of romance that they have. And so a lot of what they're going to be saying in this dialogue is sort of, thinking around love and thinking around romance with this paradigm in mind. So we'll see lots of discussion about it uh, and uh, talking about it. And so to some extent, what does this look like? We'll see what it looks like in the symposium. So that's one thing. Another thing, and they even talk about this, I think, in the dialogue, but uh, not in this part that we're reading yet, but well, a little. <laughs> so uh, when it comes to sex, basically the thought is for the, for the Greeks, the like uh, being on the receiving end, so to speak, of sex was thought to be shameful, and so you were supposed to not like enjoy that or not uh, want to be. You were not supposed to want to play that role in sex. You were supposed to sort of be penetrating somebody else. That was the sort of acceptable way to enjoy sex, and so uh, the I mean the exception is uh, women having sex with women. So they were sort of seem to be relatively fine with that, and there was nothing shameful about that except for the fact that you were a woman and so you were a lower status anyways. But when it comes to men, who again are the only people Plato seems to really care about, uh, the thought is being on the receiving end of sex, uh, so being penetrated, is shameful. And so you wouldn't want to do this with, like an, if you're a young man, you wouldn't want to do this with an older man. That would be shameful for you. If you're an older man, you wouldn't want to do this with uh, the younger man who you love, because that would be shameful for him. That's sort of not something you're supposed to be doing, like, to him. And so these were, like, supposed to be perhaps ideally sexless relationships. Were they, in fact, sexless? It, you know, presumably it varied quite a bit. Um, the, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's probably enough. Um, and so that's the sort of paradigm of romance they have in mind. I, and there's lots and lots of things to say about this. Just one tiny thing to make it look less like pedophilic. So if you go back thousands of years, think about the ages at which 
people were getting married just generally and you don't even go have to go back thousands you just have to go back hundreds or even decades like out or even right now at what age are people getting married it's not uncommon for like marriage to be like very very young people married to each other or very very young women married to much older men and so that's not to say this is good or anything um, but this is just to say it, it like older men where older is like 20 plus going after younger men that's not like um, a very big sort of divide from how much of the world was for much of human history uh the i don't it's not like an exception but the sort of unique thing about greek society as compared to for instance our society is that the romance was sort of exclusively man and man and again i mean woman and woman to some extent but plato doesn't seem to really care about this but it does show up in the dialogue you'll see it a little bit okay so th yeah that's enough again we could keep talking about this and if you have questions we can talk about it in class and stuff but that's that's enough background for us to read the symposium a bit more background what are symposia so symposia were in ancient athens uh a sort of cultural thing they were basically dinner parties you would throw a very big dinner party uh we have a picture of it here everybody would come i say everybody your friends would come they would lie around on couches uh you would spend most of the time drinking so they were big wine drinkers lots and lots of drinking so these were drinking parties basically and you would also have like entertainment there would be like slaves around playing music uh and um so drinking and slaves playing music and then also people would sort of give like speeches and stuff uh to sort of entertain uh everybody and so those are like the three main components the drinking is the main component these are like drinking parties and then you'd also have music and maybe some speeches so that's how symposia work keep that in mind as you read this like that that might sound trivial but like that's what these parties were and then read this dialogue the end for context now moving into the dialogue itself so here's symposium notice first it has these numbers on in the margins so 174 oh, sorry 172a 172b 172c etc and these continue through the dialogue these are called stephanus numbers every good edition of plato will have these numbers in the margins these refer to a uh, sort of a complete works of plato that somebody compiled back in the 18th century uh, these are the page numbers from that complete work so every good edition of plato puts these numbers in the margins so that we have a sort of standardized way of referring to each part of plato so i'll use these in addition to normal page numbers for citations in the reading quiz you don't have to use them in your paper citations, but you can if you want to. It's just good to get used to what are these, uh, understand what they are, maybe get used to reading them. So there's Stephanus numbers. It also has footnotes. Um, they should go, you, you should you should have been reading the footnotes this entire class for everything we've been reading. But like, especially these footnotes are important because these will give you context for what the heck is going on. So, you know, um, actually the very first footnote is not helpful because it's a footnote after uh, Apollodorus, and it says, see Apology 34a, which we haven't read. But uh, so there's going to be a few footnotes referring to the Apology, which we'll re read later. So you can either jump to the Apology right now if you want, or you can just uh, accept the mystery, and eventually it will be revealed. But uh, a lot of the other footnotes give you very helpful context. So please read the footnotes. Now, Symposium starts. Apollodorus. In fact, your question does not find me unprepared. Interesting way to start a dialogue. He's talking to who? Who is he talking to? Uh, he's, he's addressing the reader almost. He says your question. So it's almost as if he's talking to us. But of course, like in the, con in the literary context of the dialogue, he is not talking to us. He's talking to somebody. Who is he talking to? Hmm, good question. Uh, we get a hint on well we get we don't even get a hint we get the answer on 158 he's talking to a friend but who is this friend who is apollodorus talking to what is the context in which this dialogue is occurring try to figure it out that's one thing to keep in mind and that's to sort of introduce us to the idea that as i mentioned earlier we're reading not just philosophy but literary works these are works of literature and um it one of the things you want to do when you read a dialogue in literature when you read any literature but when you read a dialogue people back and forth is you know think about the context think about the characters in the dialogue think about what their motivations are why they're saying what they're saying uh what it means that they're saying certain things and how many speakers does this dialogue have 
um, I mean, here's a hint. Basically, it's basically just Apollodorus. And how is it a dialogue if it's just one guy monologuing? Well, uh, it turns out Apollodorus is going to tell us about another dialogue that happened. And so that's that's a weird way to frame a dialogue. Plato actually does this with a lot of his dialogues. And so it's worth thinking about why are we getting the dialogue told to us by Apollodorus? Why is Plato not just writing the dialogue itself? Why does he have this literary framing device where Apollodorus is telling this story? And one way to start thinking about that is think about the relationship between Apollodorus, who's going to be our narrator for basically the entire dialogue, and Socrates. So Socrates is going to be one of the main characters in the dialogue coming up. Uh, we get some hints about Apollodorus and how he feels about Socrates. We get lots of hints about how other people in the dialogue feel about Socrates. We get hints about how Socrates feels about other people. So try to track the sort of relationships. And I mentioned this right at the outset because Apollodorus is sort of the literary context here, and uh, he is involved in these relationships too, not just the people sort of more directly in the dialogue. So keep track of that. That's one thing to keep your eye on. Another thing to keep your eye on is the last speech, or no, the second to last speech that we're going to get in this uh, section that we're reading is Aristophanes, uh, his speech. Aristophanes is a comic playwright, so he writes comedies. He'll show up in the lecture for the Apology. He doesn't show up in the Apology. Uh, so he's a very famous comic playwright. So when he's talking, people are expecting him to be funny, and he understands this expectation. And it's not even him talking. This is Plato writing. So this is Plato using the character of Aristophanes, the comic playwright. So people are expecting Plato to be writing a funny character for Aristophanes. And so uh, try to think about the extent to which Aristophanes is a humorous character. I say try to think about, well, yeah, try it. I don't know. It's up to you. Um, here's an option. Think about the extent to which Aristophanes is a comic character in this dialogue. So is he funny? When is he funny? Like maybe some of the stuff is funny, some of the stuff is not. To what extent is he funny? Like, I don't know. He, like, he talks in various places in the dialogue, but especially he gives this speech that we're going to read. So how funny is his speech supposed to be? How funny are the people in the dialogue supposed to find the speech? How funny are we reading the dialogue supposed to find the speech? These are questions to ask yourself. They don't have straightforward answers, um, especially about the speech. Some, I don't, I don't think about it. Another thing to think about, uh, again, these are just options. There's lots of stuff to think about in this dialogue, but I'm just offering you some possibilities. Another thing to think about is there's a theme that recurs through this dialogue, and it's a very important theme for Plato's philosophy more broadly, too. Uh, so we'll see it come up in the Apology, in the Euthyphro, and in the Crito. Yeah, it's going to come up in everything we read. But it comes up pretty directly in this dialogue in a few places, kind of briefly, but again, directly. And it's this theme about, like, whose opinions do we care about and whose opinions ought we to care about? So what should you think about what other people think of you? Whose opinions especially should you, like, be paying attention to and why? Like, really. And why is really the big question for all of these. So that's a theme to pay attention to as you read this first part and also the second part. Um, because that's very relevant. Uh, so, yep, that's it.